This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. And you're listening to Python's Paradise, your film and music show. This is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, you know, I was six years old when Superman the movie came out, you know. But boy, I remember seeing that in Superman 2 at the drive-in theater. And we do not have drive-in theaters here anymore. But boy, do I remember some of the great classic films I saw that my parents took my brothers and I to. But, you know, I remember Superman, and I definitely remember the guest I have tonight because he was six foot (laughs) tall, a big, big man. And uh, he played the silent villain who had the big presence. Folks, I have the wonderfully talented, and as my previous guest Steve Joyner says, a teddy bear of a man, (laughs) Jack O'Halloran. How do you do, Jack? Hi, good evening. It's my pleasure. How are you? It's an honor to talk to you, you know. I, I feel like I've known you most of my life, and here we are both talking, but you go way back for me, you know. Oh, a day or two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 um, I saw the first two Superman movies at the drive-in theater, um, like I said, uh, years ago, and like I said, we don't have any drive-in theaters here anymore, but but uh, that was always fun, and um, of course, you played uh, the, the villain that had no voice, but he had all power, and uh, I was just wondering, how, how was it uh, uh, playing that role, and all these years later, like, the, the phenomenon of, of Superman, and and the movie, and and your character in the film. Well, you know, he, uh, I liked the idea of doing it as a mute because uh, Jackie Gleason had done a, a film called Gigo that he won an Oscar for, playing a deaf, dumb mute. And uh, and I said, if I ever got a chance to do a character like that, where I had to use facial and body expressions. I definitely wanted to do it. And then when they came up with the, when I read the Superman script and we discussed how to play the character and I uh, I liked the idea that someone had to relate to the children. And you had Terrence who was this brutish, brutish general and uh, Sarah who was this man-eating woman uh, and somebody had to so here's this huge brute of a man with all this uh, forceful strength uh, going through all the mannerisms of a child. You know, learning how to work his eyes and uh, being uh, subservient to, to Terrence, uh, General Zod, and, you know, like a child obeying an adult. And, uh, and I, so I had a lot of fun with that, and it worked out. We were very fortunate. It worked very well. Yeah, R- Richard Donner directed that first film. Now, when when he cast you, did you do that based on, like, I know you was a boxer before that. Did that come into play for you being cast? No, I I, uh, I did. Uh, the first film I ever did is a Star Wars movie. It's a classic today called Farewell, My Lovely with Robert Mitchum. Yeah, I got that listed down here, yeah. Then I was doing a film uh, with Gene Hackman called uh, March or Die. And yep. uh, the crew were English guys, and Lou Grave was the financer of the film, and uh, Hackman was in it. And, you know, uh, when they, they um, invited me back to London, uh, when Gene was going back, they wanted to talk to me about doing Superman. Um, you know, they sent me the script. I read it. And uh, I had a conversation with Donner, and I liked the ideas of what they were going to let me do. And uh, and we came to terms very simple with it. Yeah, Gene Hackman, of course, played um, Lex Luthor. And, of course, you worked with him in uh, Merch or Die. I guess you had a very good working relationship with Gene, huh? Yeah, Gene was a good guy. Really, really a very, very talented man. 
Yeah, won the Oscar for The French Connection. I, I think he's a very natural actor, you know, and uh, he, he when he retired, I mean, I didn't even know he retired. I just hadn't seen him for a while, and I just kind of looked him up and discovered he retired. But, uh, you know, he's earned his dues. I, I guess he, he's earned the right to kick his feet up. I made a lot of films, and, you know, he just uh, he has a— is uh he's got a, a nice family his wife is a nice woman and you know he's gene's a good guy i like gene a lot yeah i think uh gene's immensely talented won a couple of oscars too and uh i i gotta say yeah he played a, a great uh uh lex luther in that movie um richard donner i think is a really interesting director too of course he just had done the omen prior to superman i think it's an interesting going going from uh, um, a horror thriller to a superhero film well and, he was he was very much into the whole superman deal in fact he still does the comic books uh he and, and, and mankiewicz were just so much into superman i mean the fact that they didn't allow him to finish two, I thought was was the foolish, one of the worst mistakes they ever made. But you know, it, it is what it is. But he, uh, because he, if he had finished two, he would have done three and four, and the franchise would have been totally different. You know, I, I I've listened to Richard Donner do commentary. He, he he strikes me as a guy who has a great sense of humor. Oh, he, he's, he's, he was a brilliant director, and, is a, and he's a brilliant individual. Dick's a, a real good gentleman, a nice man. I like him a lot. Uh, he's a friend, and, uh, you know, he was, he was a pleasure to work with. Yeah, I noticed uh, Superman 2, there, there is the Richard Donner cut, and then there's uh, Richard, uh, is it Flesher, the, the, the name of the? Richard Lester. Oh, Lester, Lester, sorry, I got his name mixed up with somebody else, but yeah, Rich, Richard Lester, and uh, who went on to direct Sarah Douglas and Conan the Destroyer as well. Um, what, what, uh, now, I'm a little shady on the situation that happened be- with uh, Richard uh, Donner not uh, finishing Superman 2 and what, what had happened there. Would you like to give us the insight on the Richard Donner I mean, cut? You know, there's, there's multiple stories that, that, as to why they, uh, uh, but it, it, it boiled down to the Saul Kine's decision. They, they owed Richard Lester a picture. Uh, they said that Donner was spending too much money, which was not really true because he, he gave great value to the pictures. Um, I, I just think that the whole thing was was done very badly. That they they should never have done it. I think they harmed they harmed the film and the franchise. And, and Richard had already shot eighty six percent of Superman two. In fact, we had to stop. Uh, he got so into doing Superman two, they had to stop to finish one so they could release it. Yeah, he was, uh, and then Lester. Kane, they brought Lester on board, and uh, they just didn't want to pay Donner. That was the whole problem. They brought Lester on board, and uh, Lester had to, according to Directors Guild, you have to shoot more than 50% of a movie if you're going to put your name up as a director. So he went back, and we reshot a lot of things, you know. But uh, then when they, a few years ago, they came out with the Donner cut, which is really superb. You know, it's sad because it would have been a lot better had uh, Dick been able to finish it properly the way he wanted to. But uh, uh, if you ever see get a chance to see the Richard Donner cut, you should take it because you'll like it. Wow. Very well done. I, I, I saw the Richard Lester one, and I didn't find out until very, very short time ago that there was a Richard Donner cut. And, it really, and I asked my brother, my younger brother, about this. And I said, did you know about this? And he said, no. And he, he said, what's the Richard Donner cut? And I think Richard Donner's a fantastic director. Like, look at his career, you know, and what he's done. Oh, no, Richard's, uh, you know, the difference between Richard Donner and Richard Lester is like day and night. You know, Richard Lester's a television uh, director and Donner. Donner's the real deal. Oh, I agree. And, and like I said, he he was he lived, eat, and slept Superman. He loved it. He loved the idea. Loved the franchise. Uh, two would have been 
two would have been a better movie with him finishing it, and three would have been a better movie, and four would have been a better movie, and he probably would have done five or six of them. Oh, that boy! We were we ever robbed? Were we ever robbed? Yeah, actually, you were. Yeah, because I know Superman: Four Quest for Peace has not been heavily praised. Well, it was the, the first of all they let Canon do it, which is foolish number one, uh, which means they just sold the rights off for a piece of money. Uh, two, uh, Christopher wrote the script. Okay. You know, the, the, uh, and it wasn't that good a storyline. So uh, the movie didn't really work that well. And then, like I said, Canon was doing it, and Canon does low budget movies. So uh, that wasn't in their, in their realm. And, uh, and it showed it. It came out that way. What did you think about the fact that they brought Richard Pryor in on the third one? Well, you know, I thought they went a bit over the top. Uh, I, again, I think that uh, the, the film was too comedic, and, you know, uh, it just would have been a whole different franchise had they done what they originally started out to do and left people in place to do what they were doing. Uh, it would have been would have been a whole different it would have been a much better franchise you know than it was and you're right the fan base got cheated yeah well since i haven't seen the richard donner cut we're going to promote that just a little bit here um give us an idea some of the differences uh, uh, between the two films in terms of the storyline and stuff it isn't as comedic okay it isn't as comedic as lester's it has more of a serious tone to it and uh, it um, it shows the interaction of the villains and Superman to a bit more of a serious situation, which uh, works better. Okay. Uh, I just thought it was tighter, and uh, it's uh, you have to see it to believe it. I mean, it just uh, it, it it was a great it was a great it was a great cut. I mean, like, uh, you'll like it if you, if you see it. Wow. Yeah, I thought Superman 2 was, I thought it was really good, but I'm going to tell you, I, I got to see the Richard Donner cut and uh, see what he did. Uh, I thought he was fantastic director, and, boy, I am, uh, I, I'm ecstatic. i got to see uh, what he did with this one because I found that the, the second one had a lot more action in it than the, than the first one. Well, the second one, I you know, I, I quite liked it myself, but uh, like the Donner cut was brilliant. You know, it's uh, um, it uh, it has a bunch more action in it. It's got a lot more uh, of the villains doing what they do. I mean, in, in the Superman one, we we went out into space in the beginning of the film, yeah, uh, and uh, coming back and and two was was Superman and Us, uh, which they did, made the film a, a lot better. And, you know, um, the Donner cut is not as, like I said, is not as comedic. It's more serious. And uh, I just think it, uh, I think it worked a lot better. You know, uh, one of the scenes that uh, I, I, I really enjoyed was when, uh, you know, uh, Superman, he has you guys step outside. You know, he's outside the window. He says, why'd you guys step outside? And you guys go outside there. And I remember there was one point he grabs Terrence Stamp, of course, played General Zod, by one hand and by a leg. And he spins him around in circles and he lets him loose and he hurls up into the Coca-Cola sign. Yeah. I love that. That, that, that was all that, that was all Donner. That was uh we shot that uh I mean some of the stuff that we did, we broke we broke technology rules, you know. And and had Donner had Donner finished too, you would have had Brando in too. Brando's in the Donner cut. Oh, wow. They didn't cut Brand in Superman 2 with Richard Lester. They cut Brando out because they didn't want to pay him either. Oh. And Boy, was, they were being awful Mar cheap. How do you cut Marlon Brando out of a film? Y um, yeah. This doesn't, uh, I mean, it shows you the foolishness of people. So, 
the, the the Donner Cut has a lot of things in it that are just a lot better. But uh, we uh, we broke a lot of technology rules when we did the film because we were shooting Vista Vision on Vista Vision, and when they shot us into the picture, so we weren't we weren't hanging around on wires all the time and stuff, and it made the flying fight scenes and everything so much more authentic, and they they looked a lot better, uh, and they you know it was just I I just thought it was a well done film. I I mean I uh, I liked it. I had a good time doing it. Would have been better had Donner finished what we what we started to do though. To be honest, I agree. And you know, uh, I also remember uh, <laughs> you had that big fist fight with Superman underneath the ground, and you end up being fired up there right out into the sky. <laughs> I thought that was another one of those great moments. Uh, it was. Uh, there, I mean, there was there was some great there was there were some great things in it. You know, it just is. Uh, it worked. Uh, the film. I, I enjoyed it. You know, I. Uh, I, I, I love the film industry and everything I had done to that point was uh, were big stalwart and very classy movies. Uh, Farewell My Lovely is a classic today with Robert Mitchum. It was a great film. I, I was very fortunate to work with some of the actors and technicians that I worked with in my career. You know, and uh, The Baltimore Bullet was a great movie with uh, Omar Sharif and Jimmy Coburn and you know, uh, we just uh, going up in King Kong was a, King Kong was a great experience with just was Jesse Lang's first picture, and uh, you could see that she was going to be a great talent. And Jeffrey Bridges, and you know, it was a great cast, and it uh, we had a great script, uh, so it uh, it worked out very well. You know, and so you you got used to working with with really good people, so it, it all tends to go hand in hand and when you come down and do a film like Superman uh, which becomes an iconic situation you know that uh, you're going to be recognized for the rest of your life what the yeah you worked a lot there with uh, Terrence Stamp and Sarah Douglas now Terrence Stamp you know um, you still see him quite a bit today you know most recently in the recent Tim Burton film and Terrence Stamp's got a great presence to him and uh Terrence is a brilliant actor. Terrence yes. was always a brilliant actor. Terrence was, uh, when he was younger, they, they, they touted him as being probably one of the finest upcoming actors in all of the United Kingdom. Uh, he won an Oscar at a very young age, and he did a picture of, of Soldier Blue, which was brilliant. Uh, Terrence, Terrence is just a good actor. You know, he's, uh, he's a very, very talented guy and, and a nice person. I like Terrence immensely. Yeah, he had a nice dominating presence there as General Zod, and I thought he was great in the film. And, and of course, you know, we love Sarah Douglas. <laughs> Sarah's brilliant. Sarah's, Sarah's one of the nicest ladies you'll ever meet. She's absolutely gorgeous. She's a, she's a beautiful woman, and uh, she's just a and, she's a... and she's a very good actor. So she's, you know, Sarah's got a lot of qualities that... Um, we, we all got on very well. We were like a big fact still today. Sarah's, Sarah's a very dear friend. You know, she's a, she's a sweetheart. Well, I may may be able to get her on here in February. I I reached out to her on her web page, and somebody had got back to me and told me that you know they would uh, send this on to her. And uh, it uh, sometime before Christmas, I heard back from her, and uh, she wasn't available then. But she told me to reach out to her in February, so I'm really hoping to get Sarah on here because I've been. Uh, in a... she, she does show. She's a she's a really good person, and she's had a very uh, insightful career. You know, she's a uh, she, she's a working actor. She's worked a lot. She's done some great television episodic TV shows where she had uh, an ongoing role in, and you know, she's a. Uh, I have a picture we're getting ready to do in Ireland that uh, she's going to do with us. Oh, wonderful. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have a lot of time for Sarah. I like Sarah quite a bit. Oh, I don't blame you. Sarah's got a great presence to her, too, you know. And I kind of noticed in Superman, too, when you guys are all 
uh, fighting with Superman. Um, I noticed that you and uh, Terrence Stamp, you guys take your fair share of bumps. And uh, but I notice like she'll throw the uh, the the manhole cover at him and whatnot. But she she never took a bump. And I would never, ever suggest violence against women. I would never suggest that. But I couldn't help but notice when I saw Man of Steel, uh, when uh, they did that one, there was also a very similar fight scene. Of course, there was a lot more damage done, I think, because of, you know, CGI and whatnot. But I noticed in that one, the woman did take some bumps in that well, one. Well, you know, I, the, the Man of Steel and the, and the other series, they, they're very dark. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot more vicious violence than, than we did in ours, you know, and a lot more di- direct killing of people, uh, which you know, Superman, I don't believe, would have allowed to happen. And if, if truth being truthful about it, you know, um, and I think it takes something away from, uh, you know, you have to you have to understand that Superman was the very first superhero in American history. Yeah, and uh, for them to turn around and change his costume and take the American way out of it and uh, and put him on the dark side of the street, I thought was kind of wrong, to be honest with you. Okay. Did you... So did was I was just curious, did uh, did you uh, see Batman versus Superman? And uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm assuming you've seen Man of Steel and even Superman I, Returns? I've seen them all. I mean, I, I wasn't happy about him at all, to be honest with you. In fact, we're... We're uh, we're very seriously thinking of uh, taking a shot at getting a, uh, a, a a license to do to do a film, a Superman film from Warner Brothers, and uh, because of the technology that's available today, uh, I would bring Christopher Reeve back. Oh, wow! Absolutely. If you could I do this, people would love that. What a storyline that would be conducive to what we did before and uh and i think the audience would love it you know i just uh i think that um i think another film uh like that is warranted for the audience of superman i think that they, i think they deserve it to be honest with you do you think richard donner would come back to direct well, he's getting a little bit up there now i know, know i know but <laughs> you know he was He's capable. I would ask him prior. I would absolutely ask him. Uh, the film will be done mostly uh, technically, you know. Okay. Uh, there will be. It's going to be. Um, uh, it's going to be kind of a strange shoot, uh, which I think will work because I've seen this technology work really well, and I think we could bring. Sarah, myself, and uh, uh, Terrence, uh, Terrence back, and uh, and bring us back where we're not really of age, age, but uh, maybe a few years later and stuff. Or I had a I had an idea that we we would serve our time in jail and then we get out of jail and uh, and there's a way that we would uh, re molecularize into our superpowers again. Um, and uh, Lex Luthor would help do that. So, I, you know, there's a couple of great ideas that we've had floating around uh, that I think would work. And, uh, and of course, I say, well, you know, if, if, we, if we have a restructure that we get our superpowers back, uh, Lex Luthor doing that, they could also make it to where my lobotomy gets reversed and I can speak. <laughs> oh, there you go. You know, so there's a, there's a few ideas that we've thrown around, and uh, and a lot of people like the idea a lot, and I think the movie would be absolutely huge. Well, you get a thumbs up here. I I recommend you guys go ahead, go ahead with that. I think fans yeah, deserve it. I think we will. Yeah. But when do you think that'll happen? Do you have any idea? I uh, it would have to be um, would take. Probably a few months of the guy. Probably by uh, two eighteen. Okay, well, that'd be something to look forward to. I, I'd definitely be interested. Well, I think the fan base would go bananas. I really do. I think they would just 
they would applaud us for doing it. Well, you I know. think they need it. I was just wondering, uh, what are your memories of Christopher Reeves? It's uh, kind of sad what happened to him later in life. Christopher was Christopher was a good kid. You know, he was he, he was uh, a little young in, in heart and spirit. Uh, he had a lot to learn. Uh, he, uh, but you know, he got there at the end. You know, he was uh, um, Christopher was. You got to understand that it's the first major thing he ever did was Superman, and he looked the part. And oh, he was. You'll never. They'll never get another one. No. I'll tell you something. As far as playing Superman and Clark Kent, he was brilliant, right on the money. And I remember when he came on the set the first time, he was a little skinny kid. Now he was tall, he wasn't little, but he was he was very light. He was only like 175 pounds. Okay. And we put together a program to build him out. You know, and the and the guy that did uh, Darth Vader was a bodybuilder, and I said, uh, to David him, Prowse. Know, yeah, I said, you know, you don't want to bulk him. You don't want to make him bulky. And he didn't want to wear anything underneath the costume that showed muscular structure. So I said, you know, you want to do like uh, like a Steve Reeves. Uh, Steve Reeves, when he when he was Mr. America, only weighed like 190 pounds. But he was cut. He had definition and cuts that were brilliant. So I said, if you do that with him, the, the costume will fit him really great, and he'll look good, and it'll work good. And that's what they did, and it, and it worked out very well. It worked really good, actually. What are your uh, uh, memories of Margot Kidder? I loved her in the film. Margot's brilliant. Margot's a sweetheart. She's, a, she's just a lovely woman. She's a very talented actor. Uh, and we had a lot of fun. And, and, and she's still a lovely person. I... I, I consider her a dear friend. I like Margot a lot. That's funny. I, I just interviewed last year a couple of people from Black Christmas. And, um, of course, she was in that. That was shot here in Canada. And um, she was great in that. And she was great in Sisters by Brian De Palma as well. Oh, she was Canadian. You know that. Oh, I know that. Yep. And very beautiful. I always thought she was gorgeous, uh, Margot oh, Kidder. Yeah, Margot. Margot's Margot's a trip. Margot's. A, she's a lovely lady. She's. She, you're right. She's a very pretty woman. Well, it's interesting because uh, when I was t- re- interviewing Lynn Griffin from Black Christmas, there was this uh, um, scene where she's talking about the the uh, zoo animals going to the zoo and watching the animals have sex and she was wondering you know whether Margot had uh, improvised all that because it was so off the top funny and I was just wondering what during when she was doing uh, Superman as low as Lane D- did she improvise any of that or did she come off that way or oh, yeah Ma- Maggie improvised a lot of stuff she was she's just a great actor she we had a lot of fun with her she was uh you know, I mean, when you you have a picture, you have you have a beauty like her, you have a beauty like Sarah, you have a beauty like Valerie Perrine. You yeah. know, it was uh, you're surrounded by some very talented, pretty women. You know, and it was uh, it was great. We we just we had a lot of fun. We were a very tight family, like, and it worked really well. And Mark McClure was a super kid who played Jimmy Olsen. Uh, you know, and Jeff East was a good kid who did uh, Young Superman. And of so course, the whole the whole cast was uh, was phenomenal. Ned you know, Beatty, uh, Jackie Cooper was great. I mean, uh, we we just uh, Ned Beatty was is a, is a wonderful man, and a very very talented actor. Uh, it just did it, you know all the people. That were connected is you get shows like that where everybody clicks together very well. What were your memories of Mar- Marlon Brando? Huh? That's what happened. You know, everyone <laughs> just really clicked together well, and that uh, and it worked really good. You know, uh, I couldn't have been happier. I, I I enjoyed the film immensely. I was just wondering, do you have any uh, interesting uh, memories of Marlon Brando? Brando was 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 great. I mean, uh, uh, when he first came on the set, and I, I, Robert Mitchum said, "You got, you must go down and say hello to Marlon. Tell him I said hello." And 
and uh, and I walked down on the set to see him, and he was surrounded by reporters, and he stopped everything to walk over to say he wanted to meet me so bad because uh, my family were from New York, and uh, uh, and I was a fighter, and and he was very much into boxing, and uh, it was just uh, he and I got on like a household fire. I. I had so much time for Marlon. I liked him immensely. He was a brilliant, brilliant actor. Uh, you know, we we shared some great moments on set. And, you know, I used to go down to watch him work because when Marlon came to work, you could hear a pin drop when he walked on the set. You know, and he was very respectful to people. He, 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 he like, like Robert Mitchum and a few others that I worked with, you know, they would walk up to everyone in the morning and say hello, and they would say goodnight when they left, which is a class act, you know. Uh, and it just made a better, harmonious situation with everybody. And he, um, we, we, we were doing, he was doing a shot. I went down to see him work one day, and he was doing a shot. And, uh, he, I never saw anybody do this before, but he, he was in the middle of a shot, and something malfunctioned in the camera. And instead of stopping and restarting the whole thing all over, he just turned around and then turned right back into the shot, and they picked it up and continued it. And, and, and I, it was, I said, wow, man, that's, you know, he came down off the set, and, and he had cue cards everywhere. I mean, there were uh, cue cards everywhere, and I, you know, he came down off the set, and I said to him, you know, what is with, what's with all the cue cards, man? I said, are you that bored with the industry? Oh, no, no. He said, uh, he said, well, I started that with Mutiny and a Bounty. I, I, he said, I just didn't, I don't want the camera or anyone to to, to get the impression that I, I studied the lines. I want to make it look like I'm taking them out of the air. And I looked at him, and I laughed. I said, you know, Marlon, you're so full of shit. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and he laughed, and he and he sat there, and he 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 was a great Shakespearean actor, and he ripped off several parables of Shakespeare, and he looked at me and he said, "That you must know word for word. This stuff, piece of cake." <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned farewell, my lovely, and I'm going to tell you, you 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 work with uh, Robert Mitchum, who of course classic, uh, brilliant actor. And um, of course, Charlotte Rampling was in that, oh, and man. yeah, Charlotte you... Rampling, Tony Zerbe, uh, you know, Sly had a small part, Stallone had a small role in it, but uh, Anthony Zerbe, Harry Dean Stanton, John Ireland, I mean, you're talking about some great actors, you know. Joe Spinell. Joe Spinell was he was he was came from New York with his crew, of uh, Stallone was with him and. Uh, Jimmy Archer was with him. Uh, they're all a bunch of uh, fill-in actors from New York. They all come out like a package, you know? Yeah, and they they, they all really went. Pl- unfortunately, we lost Spinell way too soon. Yeah. Oh, Joe, Joe passed away, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, when I had uh, Caroline Monroe on here, she related some very fond memories of uh, Joe Spinell from Maniac. But uh, Stallone still with us, and Harry Dean Stanton still with us. Um, yeah, guess... Harry's still with us, but he's not with us. You know, he's 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 dementia is really bad. He's uh, but Harry. I mean, I did my screen test with Harry. Harry Harry and I have been friends for a long time. When I when they brought me out to do the film, and um, they set up to do a screen test at Richard Woodmark's old house, and Harry Dean Stanton read the lines with. Okay. I went out to do, that was the first time I was ever in front of a camera. And he was very supportive, and he was there. And Harry was a good guy. I liked Harry a lot. Oh, I like Still Harry like Dean Staten, yeah. And Sylvester Stallone, i got to say, last year at the Oscars, I, I was so sad he did not win for Creed. Uh, you know, I, would, I thought he deserved it. Well, he's uh, sly as sly. I mean, he was, uh, he did... The story of Rocky was my life and Chuck Wepner's life. Yeah. I was the Philadelphia gangster fighter, and Chuck Wepner was the bleeder. And, of course, you know, King Kong, another major uh, picture that you did. You did before Superman. And, and uh, 
there's been a few variations of King Kong out there. Of course, you had the classic 1933 version with Faye Rye. Hey, yeah, I, I thought that the, the Kong that we did worked really well. Uh, it was a great script. Uh, there was a great cast. I mean, uh, Jeffrey and Eddie Lauder and, uh, I mean, everybody involved, Charlie Groden. Uh, again, we had a lot of fun, and we worked a long time. We worked, like, I think eight or nine months on that film. Yeah. Uh, long yeah, Jeff, Jeff Bridges, uh, he's really, really, really come into a, a brilliant actor as well, especially with the, the big Lebowski and stuff. Brilliant actor. Yeah. Oh yeah, but so is Jesse. Jesse. Oh, Jesse. I mean, that Lynch. was her first picture, but you could tell that she was going to be a star. You know, she she just had a great quality about her. And she's a uh, and she's a super lady. She's just a really nice person. Yeah, and like between Superman and and King Kong, like that. That's two really big. Uh, uh, larger than life movies that you were part of, and of course, uh, um, how, how do you feel about that that experience here in in, in 2017 about being part of these uh, extraordinary big pictures? I, you know, I look back and, and I was very fortunate in my career. You know, uh, that I did pictures that are co uh, iconic like that. You know. Um, uh, King Kong was it was it was a big experience because it was the biggest movie they were doing in Hollywood. Uh, Superman was was the biggest movie they were doing in Hollywood at the time, and uh, to do Superman one and two uh, was uh, was a thrill. You know, it, uh, I, I got a chance to do something that I really wanted to do by playing uh, a deaf mute and. Uh, or, or a mute, you know, and, and being able to use body language and everything and, and, and relate it the way I did, and, and and it worked very well. It came off good. So, you know, you... And, and the film was... Um, you knew it was going to be a big, iconic movie. Because the way the things that we did, the script that we had, uh, Donner was brilliant. And, you know, there's just uh, too many very good elements in it for it not to have been what it was i noticed with superman 2 with its release it it was released in australia in december of 1980 but it wasn't released in america till june of 1981 well they wow is that true Oh know. yeah, I I went on the Internet Movie Database and I was looking it up. Well, I know that they I I know like I said they had to go back to finish it, you know, because they were late releasing it because uh we were still shooting Superman 2 when uh they had to finish one to to finish it, you know. Uh so and when Lester came on board, it uh we, it took a long time to go back and reshoot all the stuff that he wanted to put his logo on, you know? Okay. So we did a lot of work, and we worked uh, twice. We did scenes that we had done once, and we did them again. So we did them in a different director's light, you know? Yeah. So it, was, it was an experience, you know, it's stuff that you learn, and... Um, it, it, thank God that it worked out pretty well. You know, Superman 2 was was still a great movie, and, but I think it could have been, if Donner would have finished it, it would have been better. Agreed. You say that because it was still a pretty good film as it came out, you know. Um, and it's still, 40 years later, it's still an iconic movie, so we must have done something right. Yeah, and of course you mentioned earlier March or Die, which also a great cast. You, uh, Gene Hackman, Catherine Deneuve, Max von Sydow, uh, Ian Holm, you, you, great and character. Terrence Hill. Terrence Hill was a huge Italian star, and it was the first picture he ever did where he spoke English. <laughs> okay. He was, uh, he was a fun kid to work with. He's in fact he's still he does a series in Italy today. He's still working. He. Terrence was uh, that was his first American Ventures. He um, prior to that he he did a series of pictures with a guy called Bud Spencer. They were westerns called My Name Is Nobody. Okay. And they were uh, 
like slapstick westerns, but you know they were big pop. He was a he was a big box office star. They got a lot of money for him out of Germany when we did March or Die. And March or Die, sadly enough, the if you ever see the four, there's a four hour version they did for TV, which is absolutely brilliant. And to cut, you know, a little under two hours out of four hours. Uh, puts a few holes in the picture, which is sad because there were some great scenes that were shot. And it was uh, we were on location. We authentically did a lot of things, and um, there were there were a lot of things about the picture that I liked a lot. I mean, you, we had an amazing cast. I mean, Max and Cedal. I mean, geez, this one Marcel Bazoufi was in it. Ian Holm and. Uh, Harry Anderson, and uh, there were just all kinds of people. And then the gorgeous English actors to American actors to Catherine Deneuve. Catherine Deneuve, yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah, well, she'd be right up there with Margot Kidder and uh, Sarah Douglas. Oh, uh, Margot, Margot's a pretty lady, but Margot doesn't hold a candle to Catherine Deneuve. <laughs> Catherine Deneuve was one of the prettiest women. Shoot. Well, her and Jesse. Jesse's right there. Oh, Catherine Deneuve, gorgeous, Catherine gorgeous yeah. Gorgeous one. Absolutely, I agree with you 100%. Uh, another another big film that you was in, a big comedy, uh, Dragnet. Dragnet worked well. Dragnet was a fun movie to do, and, uh, you know, it. Uh, it's one of those films that if you saw it 50 times, you would get 50 different comedic lines that you missed. It had so many great one-liners in it that uh, Danny Ackroyd was brilliant. I mean, he he had Joe Friday down to a T. He did a lot of homework for it. Uh, he was, uh, and, and you know, it was, it was a breakthrough movie for Tom Hanks. Yep. Uh, Dabney Coleman was great in it. And it was uh, Harry, poor Harry Morgan. He was, Harry was uh, in the original Dragnet, the series. And he uh, he was um, he had he had some senility problems when we did the film. We lost him a couple times. He wandered off, but he was okay. but he was still great. He was you know Harry was Harry. He was he was a he's a good actor. We had, we had a lot of fun doing the picture. The picture worked out, and the picture worked well. It did very good. I know? met I met Dan Aykroyd about ten years ago. He was doing a wine bottle signing. Uh, here in Fredericton, and uh, he signed. Super guy. Yeah. Another Canadian. He's Canadian. Yeah, he signed my Blues Brothers uh, DVD, and uh, there was. Yeah. yeah, he was just a gentleman. I got my picture taken with him, and. Uh, yes, he and he's a really nice man. You know, it's funny because you went from fighting with, with uh, uh, Christopher Reeves as Superman to, to uh, going going up against Dan Aykroyd, and Tom Tom Hanks. It's like uh, you're you're, you're kind of stepping down on the muscle. Yeah, we had uh, was it you know Dragnet was a fun movie. We had a lot of fun doing it. I really enjoyed Dragnet. Christopher Plummer was in that, and Alexander Paul. He's a super guy, a nice man, boy. Yeah. It had a good cast. There was a lot of good people in it, and it uh, and uh, Tom Mankiewicz was great writing it, you know, and uh, it just worked well. It, it really worked well. And you worked with uh, Chuck Norris and Hero in, in in the Terror. Hero in the Terror was uh, was a different kind of picture. Yeah, Chuck was. Uh, Probably the best acting job Chuck ever did. He was a good guy to work with. I like Chuck a lot. He was, uh, uh, he, you know, Chuck was Chuck, you know. <laughs> he, uh, but Hero in the Terror was, uh, it was a great experience. I, I, en I enjoyed myself. I, you know, I, again, I got to play a character that, uh, I, my, my wife came down on the set to watch me work one day and, and I was coming down a ramp in a garage, and she saw me walk up as one person and turn around and come down in the shot as a total different person. She said, you scared the hell out. I don't know whether I could sleep with you tonight. I scared her so much. No, but it, uh, it worked out good. It was, you know, it was, Hero and the Terror was, it was, uh, it was, it was an okay film. I had a lot of fun doing it. 
Yeah. And the other pitchers you had listed, you mentioned, of course, uh, Baltimore Bullet. Baltimore Bullet was, was a treat because uh, working with Jimmy Coburn was brilliant. It was Bruce Light, Brock Leitner's first picture. And working with Omar Sharif was out of this world. Oh, Omar yeah. was Omar, I was sad that the picture, they, they ran out of money, the distributors, and it never really got the proper release because it's actually a very good movie. If you ever get a chance to see it, you you should because it uh, you had the, the best pool players in the world were in that movie. Minnesota Fats, I mean, Moscone was in it. Uh, uh, the whole, whole slew of, of real fine pool play. They shot the actual nine ball tournament at MGM Studios that year. Yeah. And Omar was a, was a good pool play. I mean, Omar Sharif was just um, a, a, another incredible actor. Just a, a, a lot of fun. I mean, he, he just he was, um, he, was a, he was a great backgammon player. And he invented the first backgammon board game. Okay. When he came on the set all the pool hustlers that were there, Hopkins and all these guys, they were, couldn't wait for him to come in. They wanted to play him backgammon. Because they're gambling degenerates all. They, and they, he, come, he, said, he said, fellas, I just came in to get my makeup checked. He said, give me a chance to get my feet on the ground. I just got off the airplane. He said, oh, yeah, no problem. We just we, we really like to play some backgammon. Well, he invented, the, like I said, the first board game. So backgammon was was a strong game for him. I never saw anybody take five hundred hours off of people so fast in all my life. <laughs> I mean, he just the cube spun this way, that way, and wow! <laughs> I, I, he just said to me, he just said, "Watch this, Jack. You'll enjoy this. This is gonna, we're gonna have a lot of fun." And he was a fun guy. He was he was another gentleman. I I, I really I had a lot of time for Omar. Omar was a nice person and a great actor. I agree. Yes. Of yeah. course, Jimmy Coburn. Jimmy Coburn is is Jimmy Coburn, a super actor. You know, so we had a lot of fun on the set, and and it's a neat little movie. And it's just very sad that, like I said, that they didn't have the money to uh, to distribute it properly. It would have done much much better. Another couple of pictures that uh, had you done. You did, of course, Mob Boss. That was a favor. I did a few small. Productions as favors for people, uh, which was good. You know, we, we we had a good time doing it. It was a cute little movie. And the Flintstones. Flintstones was uh, was was it was an experience. Uh, it was the first time I think I, I ever had any footage cut out of a movie. And they, I mean, they came to me. I did a couple really great scenes in in it that were sequence scenes and. Uh, they came for me to do commercials because of them and all, and then they they cut them out to make room for Liz Taylor. Oh, I was never cut out of a picture before. I was quite quite angry actually. I said, you know, this is ridiculous. But you now Flintstones was another experience. Well, I think a lot of people were quite angry with the Flintstones movie. Yeah, I wasn't very happy with it. To tell you the truth. They could have done for the money they spent. It should have been a lot better film, and you know. Uh, but and Rosie's a bit of a trick to work with, so it was it was interesting. Yeah, well, it won uh, two or three Razzies, so. <laughs> uh, well, it's you know they, they uh, could have been a lot better film. Yeah, well, they did well at casting John Goodman as Fred. I'll say that. Yeah, John was a nice guy. John was John was a good guy, and Rick Moranis is a nice guy. Played. Uh, Bernie, sidekick, and yeah. uh, you know, and Elizabeth uh, Park, uh, uh, Wilma was it was a, a neat lady. She's a good lady, uh, and Betsy, the woman who played Betsy, it was a good person. Had a nice, they had a nice cast in it, but the director was a bit of a schmuck. And you know, when you when you shoot a forty to one ratio, you know you're you're. Anybody can make that film work at least half decent. When a director shoots eight to one ratio, now you got a movie maker. I wanted to ask you about um, some of your your boxing days. Like I, I was reading on Wikipedia, and 
you came so close to having a fight with Muhammad Ali, and it didn't quite happen. We were signed four different times. Uh, actually, he was supposed to fight me in San Diego. I came to San Diego, and I won the California heavyweight title, and uh, and I had knocked out a half dozen people, and they, they, they had, I moved myself right into position to fight Muhammad Ali, and uh, he and I made an agreement. We sent telegrams back and forth, and... Uh, Norton was owned by two very wealthy gentlemen in San Diego, and they put $3 million in a briefcase, and they went to Chicago, and they sat down with Herbert Muhammad, and Norton fought Ali, and I didn't, you know. And it, uh, but he promised that we would fight somewhere, and we, we were going to fight in Australia when he fought Bugner, and uh, it was a couple times we were supposed to fight, and it just didn't happen. But we were good friends. I, I loved him as a gentleman. He was a he was a, a great athlete and a great person. Yeah, we just lost him too. Not uh, j- truly uh, missed yeah. the guy. He's, uh, he will be. I mean, if you knew how much of an adversary he was for the country, he was he was brilliant. I mean, he just uh, he was an amazing human being. I, I had a lot of time for Muhammad Ali. I kind of liked him a lot. What was your toughest boxing fight? You got a t- your tough one, like your toughest. God, I don't know. It, it, I, I had so many fights. Uh, I uh, uh, I don't know. The Norton fight was kind of a, maybe a little bit angry because I was actually beating him, and I got, I I, uh, I got hit with a shot that I you know was my own fault. I should have trained. I didn't train as diligently for some fights as I should have, and. I suffered from a disease called acromegalia when I was boxing, which meant I shouldn't have boxed at all. Uh, but uh, when I put my soul and heart into it, no one ever beat me. And I beat some pretty good fighters. And I had the great recognition of being one of ten heavyweights that, that never boxed amateur that was a world-ranked fighter. Yeah, wow. It, that... Uh... It, uh, but it was good, you know. Boxing was, I mean, I, I like I said, I, I, I did a lot of foolish things, and you know, I, I would take fights on two days' notice for three days' notice, and I didn't care because I was a tough kid, and you know, I just, uh, it was, a, I was doing other things. Boxing, if I'd have focused on it the way I should have, it would have been a different story. But that's, I have no one to, I don't blame anybody but myself. You know, I was my own worst enemy. What was it like going from boxing to acting, like the transition to do that? It was, I, I tell you, a funny story. I, you know, I, um, I, they did a picture called The Great White Hope. Okay. James Earl Jones. And they wanted me to do the picture very badly. Fox. And they, they wanted me to play Jess Willard. And the deal was all done. It was put together by some people from the East Coast who wanted to get me off the street and uh, wanted me to, to do the movie. And uh, uh, and I had just knocked out Manuel Ramos, who was like number two in the world. And no one ever knocked him out or knocked him down before. And I, uh, it was just to show you, that when I was focused on something, I had went away to South Africa to fight in South Africa. And I got in great shape down there because I was off the streets. And I was running the mountains down there every day, and I, I and I fought a kid down there that they called a draw, which meant I beat him pretty easily. And when I came home, 11 days later, I fought Manuel Ramos in L.A. So I was in excellent, excellent condition, and and I knocked him out in the seventh round. And nobody ever hurt this guy before. He was a he was a tough, tough Mexican kid, and um, and it, and it was a big you know boost, but. After I knocked him out, nobody wanted to fight me. <laughs> so it was uh, three or four months later when they, they proposed the Norton fight. And, uh, you know, it, it was a long time to lay off for me. And so when I, when I fought Norton, I mean, uh, when they proposed the, uh, the Foreman fight, and after I knocked out Manuel Ramos, they wanted me to do this movie, and they wanted me to quit boxing and go to Spain for six months and do a film and I said wait a minute I just knocked out the number two heavyweight in the world and you want me to hang up my gloves and go to Spain for six months you know 
And the guy said, well, but we're going to pay you $1,500 or something a week. And there was a lot of money in those days, I guess. But I said, you know, I give that away in tips. You're not paying me nothing. You're asking me to give up a shot at the heavyweight championship in the world for what, a movie? Uh, I said, I don't think I'm ready for it yet. And I, and I was, and when I said no, 84 was, was sweating bullets because the deal was already made. All I was supposed to do was go sign a contract and boom, Bob's your uncle. Oh. And I was leaving the building, Fox building, and James Earl Jones was coming up the steps and, and he stopped me and he said, Jack O'Hara. And I said, James Earl Jones, he said, is it true what I just heard about you? I said, well, it depends on what you heard. He said, you just turned down the biggest movie in Hollywood? I said, uh, well, I guess if you want to put it that way. So i got to shake your hand. He said, I never knew anybody that told Hollywood to go to hell before. <laughs> <laughs> Especially a big movie like this. My heavens, he said, you know, i, I got to commend you. And Steve McQueen was really angry at me because he wanted me to come to Hollywood so bad. He uh, tried to get me to do the Thomas Crown Affair in Boston. And I was just starting out boxing, and I said, I don't think so. And he he said, no, nah, man, you got to come out. you got to come to Hollywood. We'll have a good time. It'll be great. You'll love it. And he did a picture called uh, The Towering Inferno, and his name was Captain O'Halloran. And he called me up. He said, how would you like your name up in the screen? He said, come on, get yourself out of here. And I, when I turned down... The, when I turned down the Great White Hope, he was, oh, my God. So, you know, but it wasn't I wasn't my time, wasn't ready yet. But when they called me to do Farewell, My Lovely, I had just retired from boxing. I was running a couple construction companies on the East Coast, and I looked around. I said, you know what? I think it's time. And I went out and did a screen test in uh, California, and they, Robert Mitchum said, it's either him or I don't do the movie. Oh, Oh, I said, Mitchum, it's all your fault. I blamed him. <laughs> well, you can't go wrong working with Robert Mitchum. Can oh, you? my God, he was wonderful. Robert was probably one of the most well-read men I've ever met in my life. I loved Robert. Robert was like a father to me. I, we got on like a house on fire. He was a tremendous, tremendous person. You mentioned Steve McQueen. What was he like? <laughs> oh, I love Steve. Steve was great. Steve was, Steve was, like, a, Steve was like a kid in a candy store. He, he had great stardom, and, and he became a big star. And he, but he was like a kid inside. He, you know, he loved motorcycles. He spent a lot of time in the desert with the American Indians, and did, did a lot of things for them out there. And uh, he was a kid who couldn't say no. And I felt bad for his wife Nell, who was a wonderful lady. I mean, just an amazing woman. And and Ali McGraw went to his house to a party and left with him. You know, he just, he couldn't say no. It was a trip. Yeah, was, I would have been. Guy, a great actor. A brilliant, brilliant actor. Yeah, he was, died in 1980. I would have been eight years old when he passed away. I love Much too young, much too young. Yeah, I, I liked him in Bullet because he doesn't say a whole lot, and he conveys a lot in his eyes a, and reactions. Act, and Steve, was, Steve was a very, very good actor. Yeah, I, I agree. And Sam Pebbles, he was unbelievable. Sam Pebbles, he won the Oscar for. He was brilliant. You know, he just uh, he um, he just was a, a great escape. And the great escape he did, he did his motorcycle driving and the guy that was following him. He did oh. both. Oh my! I did not know that. It was uh, you know, he was a very action-oriented guy and he was one of the few people that came from television and became a big movie star yeah that doesn't happen every day oh. and he was just he was just a very talented guy he was a, you know he was a and a really nice guy I mean I like I had a lot of time for Steve I liked him a lot you know we got to talk about a book you did you did a, a, a book called uh, um, family legacy, legacy. yeah, yeah. Family legacy. Uh, great I, read. I yeah, I I haven't read it, but I was reading up on it on uh, on uh, Wikipedia before I gave you. Well, actually, wasn't be I gave it a reread, but I read it a few days ago, and uh, that is quite uh, 
the story uh, that you're telling. It, it's a story. My father was a very infamous gentleman, and uh, he was probably one of the most feared Italians ever to come into America. And he ran a, a company in New York called Murder Incorporated. And he uh, he came from an era that the country will never see again. And they were part of the birth and building of a country. And they uh, uh, there's a lot of things that, a lot of truths that need to be said and need to be sorted out before people die. And and we're going to do that. You know. So the book the book tells a lot of truth, and it tells the truth about the Kennedy assassination, and it, uh, it it tells the truth of changes of an era. And when we do the series, we're going to go way back to the very beginning. And, uh, and and show just how uh, organized crime, the government, industry, and unions were all partners for a lot of years. And a lot of the money that was made illegally was put back into the growth of a nation. And they, they actually helped to give birth to a lot of things in America, corporations, they created a lot of jobs, and I mean they they created a lot of jobs because if you didn't work, how could you gamble with them? Yeah, the main revenue for them, you know. Uh, so it's it just a lot of. Uh, it's a great read. You get an opportunity to read it, you'll enjoy it. I guarantee it. Yes, it's going to make a great television series, and the film's going to be brilliant. It's a great read. It's and we've got three more books coming out behind it. So it's uh, one of a trilogy, and there's a fourth book I think I'm going to write. Yes, yeah, so you were the, the son of Albert Anastasia. And yeah, he was kind of a prominent figure in New York. Wow. Now, now um, how long did it take you to, to write this book? Oh, I, it took me a few years because I, I, uh, I waited till some people passed away so they wouldn't go through any turmoil. But um, it's a book that I was groomed and made. Uh, I was more, more groomed to write. You know, there's some things that people need to know that unless you live them, you know, it isn't about hearsay or, or he said or she said. Uh, a lot of things in the book are first-hand experiences about what happened and you know um, so it's it's uh, it, it's gotten a lot of great uh, reviews on it people that really you know like it a lot and like I said it's going to make a great series and we're about ready to make that deal and then it'll be a huge exposure and it's gonna and the other books will come out right behind it bam 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 and they're um, it, it's gonna work well I'm looking forward to it, actually, really looking forward to it. And you say they're going to make it into a movie? Going to make, uh, it's going to be a series, a television series, okay. and there'll be films come out of it as well, yeah. It's a lot of material. Who do you I mean, think? You're talking about the growth of a country. You're talking about opening up the whole country and, yeah. and the interfacing between Europe and, uh, and, the, and the American Mafia. And the European uh, mafia and the Cosa Nostra, you know, and, uh, and governments, and, you know, it's just, uh, it's going to be interesting. People are going to find out a lot of, a lot of questions that people have asked questions about for years are going to be answered. Who do you think would play Albert? Uh, we're looking, you know, I, uh, I haven't, uh, Totally decided, yeah, and the director will have something to say about it, but we're looking. I'm um, looking for a certain individual, that, uh, and it'll come just like that, bam, you know. He was a unique individual, and he wasn't, nobody really knew that much about him. You know, he was, uh, he was a, much brighter than anybody knew. He uh, was a very reserved person in some respects, but when it came to family business, he did what he what he was groomed to do, you know. And the fun part about Albert was that in 1943, when Louis Lipke was electrocuted, his partner at Murder Incorporated, and Albert became the focus on Murder Incorporated, and they were looking for him everywhere. 
and he was a sergeant in the in the army in Indiana, Pennsylvania, Indian Gap, um, teaching soldiers how to be longshoremen. Okay. And uh, and the New York papers were had pictures of him and stories, and everybody was looking where's where is this guy? Blah, 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 blah. And the captain of the platoon of his regiment called the New York police and said, Jesus, this, this Albert Anastasia guy that you guys are all looking for. And they said, yeah, I got him right here in my army. And the guy said, hold on a minute. And he came back on the phone. And he said, ah, you're making a mistake. We're, we're really not looking for Albert Anastasia. That's, that's a mistake. <laughs> that's the kind of power they had. Wow. I mean, they had an amazing, I mean, when my father and, and Meyer Lansky and Frank Costello and Charlie Luciana, when they ran the streets, people never locked their front doors. You didn't ever worry about a lot of the crime. There was no drive-by shootings. You didn't have a, a lot of neighborhood crimes like you have today. You, you, you know, things were a, bunch, a lot different in those days. What, what was it like? Uh... Vandalized the neighborhood. There were people that, that took care of you. Forget the cops. <laughs> they would take care of you. They ran their neighborhoods very well. I was going to ask, what was it like growing up in, in that? I, uh, I didn't know who my father was till I was like 14 years old. What was, was your reaction? mother down in Philadelphia. I was a love child uh, of the 40s. I was born in 1943. Okay. And uh, I was a remnant of, of, of a love affair between my mother and Albert. And uh, um, and he left me down there with my mother to be raised and, and made sure that there were people that looked after me and taught me a lot of things. And, and then when he passed away, I was taken uh, under wing by a man called Meyer Lansky. Okay. Uh, who was one of the most intelligent men I ever met in my life and probably taught me more about business than I would have ever learned in any college. Uh, and uh, and Charlie Luciana I met in Italy and, and uh, Frank Costello in New York. And uh, there were some great people that, that looked after me, Raymond Patriarca, and, you know, and, uh, and I, um, I uh, it's one of the reasons why I didn't focus on boxing that much. I was too busy uh, involved in unions and, you know, street things, that uh, my father's business. And I should have focused more on what I was doing, but I didn't. You know, I thought I could, I was in a mindset that I could do anything I wanted. You know, I, I, I played pro football, I boxed, I did, I, whatever I put my hand to, I did. So I um, got to say, this book, um where where can you get it? Like I, I you, you Amazon. Do you got like a, is it like on your web page as well? Yeah, if you go to my web page, it directs you right to the Amazon site. It's 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 right on Amazon. Okay, you you want to plug your uh, your website, the address for it, so th those it's, are here. Uh, familylegacythenovel dot com. Perfect. You just go to familylegacythenovel all one word dot com. And it takes you right to the right to the book. Takes you to a site of mine. It tells you about my film career and everything, and tells you about the book. and uh, And it, it directs you to Amazon, where the book can be purchased. And it's um, it's 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 kind of a it's a great read. I guarantee you that uh, there's not one bad review on it. It's it's uh, it's a great read. People will enjoy reading it. They really will. Yeah, well, it sounds exciting. That's the series because we tell the real names of the people in New York and we tell the real stories, and and uh, there's a lot of truth in it. The book has a lot of truth in it. So there's, a, there's, a, there's some interesting comments from people. There was one gentleman who was like in his 90s, and, and he wrote a, a review of the book, and he said, you know, they say that the book is... Uh, is fictional like I call it fractional because they wouldn't let me write the they wouldn't let me write a uh, non-fiction book because it would, they told me they would never print it if I told the truth and nothing but the truth so we added a little bit of fiction to it and, we, and I called it fractional 
<laughs> but the guy wrote the review and he said, you know, 85% of what's in this book is very real because I lived it. I was in New York. I saw, I heard, I, you know, I lived it every day. And, uh, and it was refreshing that people found a lot of truths. In other words, uh, it's like, it's like filling out a story that you've heard so many times, but no one ever told the absolute truth about something, you know? And, and, and you're going to do three more books, huh? Yeah. Yeah, we get in fact, the sequel's uh, already done. I just have to uh, structure something, and then uh, and when we get, when we sign to do the series, then I'll uh, put the sequel out, and then the prequel to that one, and uh, I mean, the, 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 the follow-up of that, and then there's a book on Johnson, Lyndon Johnson, I'm going to write. Uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a few more books to come. Oh, gee, yeah, but in the series, uh, that'll probably be, uh, that, that'll be a, a great watch. Um, yeah, the series is going to be a killer, because we're going to go all the way back to the beginning, when they first came into America, how they set up like Roman legions in different cities, uh, in port cities and then in the center of the country and uh, how they were like a Roman legion. They were capos and lieutenants and soldiers and, you know, and, uh, and there were strict rules. And, and my father, uh, my father came from, from uh, Tropia, Calabria. He was part Sicilian, part Calabrian. And he, uh, he was a, he was a very feared man. You know, he, Albert played by the rules. If you, if you were going to, if you were going to come into the familia and you understood the business, you understood what they did. If you broke the rules, you knew what the penalties were. And if that meant getting shot, then you got shot. That's all there was to it. You know, if you didn't want to play the those rules, then don't play the game. True. True. He believed that, and he believed that if he if he let you go and, and and gave you chance after chance, you would take his kindness as a weakness and. You would eventually rat on him or turn him and other people in, and you would hurt their organization. So they were very close knit when they when they started. And they uh, they never they, they never killed any innocent people. They, everything was involved in their own inner business. Uh, they were, like I said, they you know they they you had a lot of store owners that people said that they paid them for protection, but. They got their goods on time, and no one ever shoplifted in their stores. Today, they pay the government for protection, and they get robbed blind, and they don't ever hardly get their goods, all of them. And people hijack their trucks and everything. So, you know, the irony is that it was a much safer, better neighborhoods and better, better time and better way of life in, in certain areas. Where, where are you from originally? I'm from uh, I'm from right here in New Brunswick. I um, uh, pretty much the next province over from uh, Nova Scotia. I know New Brunswick. Yeah, I've I've got uh, I've got a gentleman I do business with up there, a kid named Christopher Seely. Okay. His father's a big time preacher up there. Is a religious man. Oh. Ed Seely. Okay, I don't know that name. Have you have you been like I, I'm in Fredericton, Fredericton, New Brunswick, and uh, have you ever been in, in the province here? Oh, I've been up there years ago. Yeah, when mm. I was in when I boxed out of Boston, I used to go up there. There were a couple of fighters I knew up there pretty well. Oh wow, yeah, yeah. Um, Nova Scotia is pretty much right next door to us. You know, I I yeah. I, yeah. But uh, I always tell people probably the closest we got the celebrities here are the trailer park boys. <laughs> well, it was uh, you know it was kind of a cold place. It was cold. We get some bad winters up there, boy. <laughs> yeah, we're getting them now. You know, uh, in the old days they were a lot worse. I'll tell you, because they, they, I mean, they don't get nearly the bad winters that we had in Boston or or Philadelphia when I was a kid. As I was talking to my sister today, they. They got their first snowstorm a couple of days ago. Well, we'd have had four or five snowstorms already by now. Well, we've had winter. we've no. had a few so far. Well, you get them up there. No, no, I know you've had a few. I like I said, I do business with a guy up there, 
So I know you I know you guys have been snowed in there a little bit. Yeah, it's never fun. Winter driving is not the the best, so we're all keeping our fingers crossed for spring. <laughs> but uh it's it's all good, you know, it's uh it, it's you know, there's some beautiful some beautiful country in Canada. I've driven across Canada. From all, all the way from Montreal all the way over to Vancouver. Where is the most interesting place that, that you've uh, been to? Uh, that's that's a good question. I enjoyed living in Europe. I lived in Europe for a lot of years, and uh, I enjoyed. I, I love Italy, and uh, I liked living in Belgium. I liked the Isle of Man. I loved Ireland. Uh, I lived in London for a while. Uh, I uh, like I said, I traveled through Canada, which is some gorgeous country up there. Uh, liked a lot of their ways of life up there. Yeah. Uh, been to the Calgary Stampede. I've been, to, I mean, Montreal. The difference between Montreal and, and, and Toronto and Calgary is like night and day, you know. Uh, and then when you go all the way out to Vancouver, it's a whole different. The islands are beautiful up there. You know, you could get lost. You could go up and you could go up to in Vancouver to the Vancouver Islands, and you could spend a lifetime going from island to island. Yeah, you know, it's some pretty country there. It's, uh, it's 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 different climates all through the whole Canadian area. You know, it's just, uh, it's. And I had a lot of good friends, hockey players that were from up there, Bobby Orr and some other people that played in Boston. Yeah. Well, you you mentioned you were using boxing. Did you ever know any wrestlers? Sure. Yeah. Did you ever work with it? Huh? George. I knew Gorgeous George, and I uh, I knew uh, Argentina Raca. I knew uh, I knew quite a few of them actually. Did you know Bruno San Martino? He tried to get me to go into. Ed McMahon tried to get me to go into wrestling when I retired from boxing. Did did you know Bruno San Martino? Yeah, Bruno was a good guy, actually. In fact, I, I yeah. saw him not that long ago when they, they did a movie of his life. I think Bruno was one of the all-time greatest wrestling champions. He was a great wrestler, but, you know, all that stuff was staged, you know? Oh, I know that, was, but... Wrestling was, wrestling was a staged deal, you know, that... Uh, they, 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 they. I mean, when I, they wanted me to go into wrestling, and they said, "Geez, Jack, you gotta pull your punches. You can't." I said, "Well, you know," and I know that guys got hurt all the time, you know, uh, because they were crazy. Some of those guys. I mean, they were, you know, they couldn't control themselves. <laughs> they, so they, you know, it was. Uh, I said, "Well, you know, in fact, Ezra Charles, they, Ezra Charles was going to wrestle, and they, he couldn't because he knocked two guys out." <laughs> Guy, guy clipped him with an elbow. He turned around and decked him. You know, they said, oh, you can't do that. And he said, well, you know, this guy's not supposed to do what he did either. He said, well, everybody, they slip all the time. He said, well, not in my ballpark. <laughs> Ezra was a funny guy. I liked Ezra Charles. And you mentioned... But, you know, wrestling was a, was a great sport. I mean, it uh, it's done very well in its time. It's gotten bigger and bigger. And, you know, uh, there's a... There's a yeah, I, I I met quite a few wrestlers actually. Well, you mentioned Gorgeous George. Now he was very influential on a lot of wrestlers today, but like uh, in the Nature well, Boy Ric Flair. He was very influential actually in Ali's career. He he's the one that told Muhammad Ali. He said, you know, uh, he said, if you handle your career properly, fifty percent of the people will come to see you lose, and fifty percent of the people will come to see you win, but you'll get a hundred percent of the people. Wow, and that's what Ali did. You know, with all his boasting and all that stuff, there were people that hated him, that wanted to see him get beat, and then there were people that loved him that wanted to see him win. That's what he got everybody. I was going to ask. Gorgeous George just told him that. You know? Oh yeah, <laughs> he's smart kid. You know, he, you know, he was a. Uh, they did those guys were showmen. You know. Mm-hmm. They were all showmen, and they uh, they used to. When I boxed in San Diego, they used to have wrestling matches before as preliminaries. Did you ever have? Well, I, I got to meet a lot of the, uh, you know, the the the, the Tolles brothers, and there was a whole bunch of them. 
that wrestled out of the. They had different circuits. They wrestled the West Coast, the East Coast, up in the Northeast, you know, up in the North Country in Montana, Wyoming. There were different circuits all around that these guys came from. I just wonder when you boxed, did you ever sustain any any na- um, nasty injuries? No. Okay. Well, <laughs> you were lucky. <laughs> No, I had uh, I, the only problem I had is I, I, I boxed. I had a disease called acromegalia. That I should have never been boxing. Actually, acromegalia is a tumor of the pituitary gland, okay. which creates growth hormone in your body. I'm probably about four inches taller than I should have been. My body skeleton weighs about 45, 50 pounds heavier than it should. Oh. Is that I, what it, well, it, and it, it, what it does, it puts you through a lot of depression and stuff like that. And it's a very rare, very rare disease. Actually, more prominent in women than it is in men. Is, so is it that, causes gigantism in men. Is that and what it, Andre the Giant had? Andre the Giant had it, yeah. Richard Keel died from it. Oh, Richard Keel. Oh, that reminds me. You, you, um... I read something. I almost forgot about this. You, you turned down uh, the spy who loved me, the part that Richard Keel played. Turned down five pictures, and Richard did them all, <laughs> and it made his career. God bless him. <laughs> yeah. Turned down a spy who loved me. They, they wanted me to do the picture really badly, and I didn't really like the script. And and they and I, had, I was already doing March or Die, and uh, and and I'm glad I turned it down because I wound up doing Superman. You know. Oh, okay. So something else turned out better. Uh, for I you. just didn't. Uh, I didn't like it. So uh, they came. Cubby Broccoli came and sat in my agent's office and begged me to please do the movie. And uh, because Farewell, My Lovely was such a great movie. Okay. And they thought I was a great actor, and they just, you know, and I saw it, but I didn't. I don't know. I just couldn't see, so I didn't do it. And I, uh, and then I turned down of uh, The Longest Yard and couple other pictures i was working all the time king kong we did for like a year almost and then superman was four years you know by the time we did one and two so i i was doing work a lot i turned down uh the longest yard and there was a a, a clint eastwood movie that i really was sorry i turned down then i turned down a, when i was doing king kong they wanted me we had a break and while well, they were in new york sh- filming and they wanted me to do uh, Silver Streak, and I should have done it. I'm really sorry I didn't with, uh, with uh, Gene with Wilder, Wilder and, and Richard, Richard Pryor. Pryor. Yeah, we just lost Gene Wilder, too. Yeah, great guy. What a super guy. Yeah. And Pryor. Pryor was a good guy, too. Yeah. And I would have had a lot of fun doing it, and I should have done it, and I had the six weeks I could have done it, and, and, I, and I turned it down, and Richard Keel did that one, and he did... I, I turned down about five or six pictures that he did, and, and it was made his career. You know, God bless him. Yeah, Richard was a nice guy. Yeah. Now, we hooked up through Steve Joyner. I need to ask, how did you and Steve meet? Yeah, uh, Steve. Steve, I don't know. We he he. I was doing. He called me up to ask me to do a pod show in New York. Okay. Uh, and he. Got my number from somebody, and he called me up. We had a conversation, and and I've met him several times. And I, and I like Steve. Steve's a really nice guy. And he 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 puts a lot of people on pod shows. He helps these guys out a lot. You, uh, you know what? I I um just spoke to him for the first time uh, last very Thursday. Very straightforward, a very honest guy. And yeah, he, he knows a lot of people. Well, he he uh, was on my friends list on Facebook, and I, I guess I I knew him through uh, an actress named Lisa Wilcox, and um, and uh, you know I I was looking at I noticed some of the stuff that he was putting on Facebook, and I and uh, I didn't know who he was, but I knew he had connections. But I also noticed he had a lot in common with me, and I was able to relate to some of the stuff he was saying. So I I, I responded to one of his posts, and I reached out to him. I said. You know, let's start 2017 off with a blast for you. You could be my first guest of 2017. And and he's my 69th guest in total, you know, but he was my first from this year. And and um, he came on. We had just a fantastic talk. And he said the greatest stuff about you 
And he says to me, he says, oh, I got all kinds of people that we could bring on to your show. And um, uh, he called me today, and uh, he, he called me yesterday. And uh, I, I, I'm really honored that he's interested in what I'm doing, and I'm willing to promote uh, whoever he brings my way. And uh, he's a really nice person. He really is a nice person. Very down to earth. I, I like him a nice lot. Family is, is his wife and his kids are really nice people. And he's a frustrated actor. He wants to get it. Wants to go back on the stage on the screen. Yeah, I heard that too. You know, we'll probably help him do. You know, but he's. Uh, I like Steve. Steve's a nice guy. Steve. Steve is a and great so guy. I do these shows. He calls me up. He's. Well, would you do? That? I said, Yeah, why not? You know, if I if I'm not jammed doing something, I uh, you know. So I and I, you know, it's it's, it's good. You know, we having a good time and uh, people. You know. You, you owe stuff to fan base, and and I've done some prominent pictures, and and uh, and, and I like relating to to the people that 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 followed my career, so it's uh, it's my way of giving back, you know. Works out. It's interesting you mentioned that because I read something that bothered me recently. Uh, Jennifer Lawrence is a as a big player right now in in Hollywood, and I've Very liked her. Young lady. I, I think she's extremely talented, but I, I guess she made this quote recently where she won't do selfies, uh, selfie pictures with fans anymore because she don't know them and blah, blah, blah. And, and, oh, there's some people that get very, very, very physical and obnoxious with her. And, uh, and some of it I can understand. You know, she, they take things a bit too far, you know, touching her and stuff. You know what's interesting? Her inappropriately. Yeah, I feel bad about that. We're, see, I, where I'm here in in New Brunswick, we don't have a lot of celebrities, you know. But uh, one of the things yeah. that Steve Joyner has said to me he says, because he's listened to some of my interviews, and he said, "You you don't act starstruck. You you treat them like normal people." And um, there are normal people. Yeah, yeah, and I I find sometimes Everybody that's what pants on the same way, one leg at a time, you know. Yeah. But uh, and 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 I find I find it sad that sometimes you know things get out of hand. But sometimes I I, I wonder too. But I, the bad apple spoils the bunch. She's actually a very very nice young lady, and she's very shy, and she's a very uh, she's like a loner type person. She's a little town girl. She comes from a small place, and you know her career is boomed, man. You know she's a very talented woman, and she's done very well in her career. And uh, and people are obnoxious, you know. I don't have too much of a problem because I'm a big guy, you know. Understand? But uh, I, I know a lot of stars that they, they, you know, there's a lot of male, famous male actors that wouldn't that w- that won't sign autographs and stop, won't stop and sign autographs because people are, you'd be amazed how physical and grabby they get. Oh, that that that's sad. Because. I was gonna say that's that's sad. That ruins things. Well, it is sad because I mean, you know, uh, you know, it's like uh, Mitchum. I used to say to Mitchum, Robert, and I loved Robert, you know, and he, he and I he taught me so much about people in the industry. And I remember when we were in London together. He was doing, I was doing Superman, and he was doing uh, uh, the Philip Marlowe picture. The the one after he did the farewell, my lovely, uh, and he was, um, and they were filming over in London, and he, he wouldn't go out on the streets unless I went with him. We would, you know, take walks and everything, and uh, and, and I said to him one time, we we we, he, we stopped, we stopped, and we were in Harrods, and he went to get uh, flints for his lighter, and all of a sudden he was surrounded, you know, by I mean I mean women. I mean, really, uh, one woman just hiked her skirt and picked her leg up and, and took a flying leap at him, you know. And, and I pulled him away from out of the way, and, and she went right into the stand. And I said, oh, Jesus. And we got out the side door of Harrods and jumped in a cab. We were laughing like hell. And, and I said to him, man, I said, that, that kind of, does that happen all the time? He said, only oh, since like I'm older. <laughs> <laughs> but he said, yeah, he said, you know, he didn't stop to sign autographs in the street because when you stop for one, he said, all of a sudden you got a hundred people pulling at you and grabbing at you. He said, you know, and 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 he proved it to me. 
you know? We would be walking down the street, and the only reason why he would stop is because I was with him, you know? And uh, and I would never let anybody ever harm him. He was like my father. I loved him. He, and, and, you know, and I was, uh, when you read the book, you'll understand where I come from. So a lot of people have a very much a lot of respect for me no matter where I go in the world. Yeah. No, that yeah. That, that is unfortunate. H- here no, we don't have a whole lot of and that. Queen was the same way and, and, and some other people that I knew. You know, and it's uh, Jimmy Coburn. I mean, it's sad, you know, that people people won't allow people to be gracious. Yeah. I mean, there's people that they, they rip at your clothes. They, you know, they get they get carried away. Yeah, no, that that that's unfortunate, and uh, they wonder why people act sometimes the way they do, where they just they won't sign autographs, they won't do this. I mean, there's a lot of actors that were like that, you know, they wouldn't uh, unless something was fixed that it was being controlled, then they would they would sign autographs for people. They were very pleasant with people. There's a lot of actors that take selfies with people until things get out of hand, you know. There, there, but, uh, there. It's people that people that ruin situations, unfortunately, and it's very sad. I and mean, you, know, you would think that they would, they would have the common common decency to, to respect somebody's, you know, individuality. Yeah. There, there is a kind of a flip side though when you hear like Justin Bieber uh, urinating right. in a mop yeah. button, huh? huh? Now you're talking about young kid that, that made a lot of money too young. He's a bit of an ass. Yeah. I, I hated hearing about he urinated in a mop bucket. Now, that's uh, a janitor. He, he does stupid, stupid things, and that's immaturity. And he you know? sp- looks over a balcony and spits on his fans. like. Uh, he's lucky that he's got bodyguards around him. So, yeah. Probably would have had his lunch handed to him a lot of times, you know. Uh, and he and he thinks he's a tough kid, and he's you know he's one day, one day he's going to get his coming up and guarantee it. Oh yeah. Well, he was speed. I guess he was speeding he's through the. Because well, he's a talented kid, and and he has a great following. Why would you want to muck it up so badly? You know. I mean, and I've been around. You know, I, I, I knew the Bee Gees well. Uh, uh, I knew, you know, uh, uh, Eric Clapton. I mean, all the groups in England, because we all, I lived over there doing Superman and all. We all hung in the same places, Elton John, everybody, you know. And, and they're such normal, great people. The Beatles, uh, you know, uh, Jaggered and the Stones, you know, they, uh, they all had their own little niches in the world, you know, and, 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 they're, and, they're, and they're very kind to, their, to, their, to, to, the, to the public, you know, uh, Rod Stewart, yeah. all of them. But they, all, they also have their drawbacks, that they have to be careful that no one harms them. Kanye West is another one that's really pushing the envelope. He's been around a while. Well, do you see that situation where he was addressing the crowd to get oh, on their... Oh, you're talking about Kanye West. Kanye oh. West, yeah. Oh, he's full. He's another asshole. Oh, man. I, I, he tells he's this group... He's lived to... in his own world. He's, you know, he, he just, he does... I mean, he when he grabbed the mic, when he insulted Taylor Swift right in public television and all, I mean, he does a lot of... You know, and and blames it on that he's this creative genius, which is which bullshit. Is bullshit. No. Yeah, I'm I'm wait. You'll never see him get up and take that mic away from somebody a little bigger than he, though. No, you never will. <laughs> you never will. Because he, he get his... his way around certain things, and and again, there's another deal. One day he'll he'll walk into the wrong person, but he knows where to do it and not to do it. Trust me, he's not that stupid. Yeah, well, like a lot of he's like a lot of those rapper guys that they they get carried away, but they know when to stop and when not to stop. And it's, you know, unfortunately though, they pick on a lot of people that they can get away with it with, and 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 that's not a you know, it, it's not necessary. Why do it? It just makes no sense to me. Yeah, not necessary. I just never, 
I never could understand it. I mean, one of the nicest guys in the world was, was Robin Williams. Oh, Robin Williams yeah. used to talk to people all the time, but then people got carried away with him. Yeah. Or he wouldn't uh, talk to people anymore. Well, you know, I, I heard that, like, through Autograph Collector Magazine said, always had him as a, a, um, a positive uh, uh, person, though. They, they always said that he was a good signer, so. They... Well, he was brilliant. Robin was one of the nicest guys in the world. I mean, he gave back to the people that made him a star. He was very appreciative of it, you know. It was sad we lost him. And it was a great loss. It was a terrific loss, actually. Yeah. Really was a terrific loss. Well, Jack, I I gotta say it was such an honor, such an honor talking with you. My I, pleasure. Thank you. Have yeah. A nice time. Oh, it was so great that, that Steve uh, uh, Joiner uh, hooked us up, and uh, he told me that I was gonna have a great time talking to you and going through your career and uh, your reflections on Superman and Superman Two, and I definitely got to see that Richard Donner cut. You got me kind of. Yeah, you'll enjoy. quite good yeah and uh you know and your boxing career and and your book and uh i'm gonna tell you 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 know you're you're just you're just like uh steve described you're this big hulking guy you're the you're you're a big teddy bear (laughs) (laughs) well i appreciate it and you have a nice evening and thanks a lot And, and please send me a copy of this would you I oh, I will. I, I'm going to tell you, though, because I'm only on once a week, this probably won't air until about about spring. I hope you're patient with me on that. Right. I, I'm, I'm hoping to, to get my show expanded for more time, but uh, I've been struggling with that. But um, if, if you don't hear from me in a, for a while, uh, the interview was fine. It's just a matter I've got so many interviews backed up. It's, it's just, right. yeah. You know, right. but you know, like uh, I said, have a have a great New Year and uh, and and a lot of luck to you in, in what you do. B- before you go, would you please do a, a plug for my show? Sure, positively. Yeah, J- just uh, state your name, and uh, my show is called Python's Paradise, and okay. and uh, say so you're you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise, and add on that that uh, I'm in New Brunswick, Canada. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay. My name is Jack O'Halloran, and you good people out there are listening to Greg Gilbert on Python. Python what? I'm sorry. Parad- Python's Paradise. <laughs> Let's do it again. Yeah? Sure, go ahead. My name is Jack O'Halloran, and you good people are all listening to Greg Gilbert on Python Paradise. And up there in New Brunswick, Canada area, and I hope everybody tunes in and Hope you all have an enjoyable evening because I just had a great time with the gentleman. And watch, Be well. yeah, and watch Richard Donner's version of Superman Two. You'll enjoy it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, uh, Jack O'Halloran, and I want to say God bless you and thank you, thank you very much. My pleasure. You take care. You too. Thank you, and I'll I'll uh, send you an email uh, here soon. Thank you. You're welcome. God bless you.